Hey everybody, welcome to the Unreal Engine live stream. I'm Alexander Pascal, and joining me today is Charles and Ben. Uh, ben by <laughs> Skype, of course. Uh, today we're going to be talking about Paragon, uh, its anim dynamics, and uh, it's kind of the, the physics around uh, of the animations, I assume. Kind of yeah, thing. yeah, it's basically a, a lower end, uh, a cheaper simulation system for, cool. for uh, uh, doing uh, uh, physics and dangly bits and stuff like that. Yeah. So that's going to be pretty neat. And we have a couple of items coming up first. I'm going to steal this mouse from you. Mm -hmm. And over onto the main screen, we'll go through the news. First up, uh, 4.11 Preview 3 has been released and is now available on the launcher. You can pick that up uh, off the Graphic Games launcher. Pretty quick, pretty easy. Please do uh, try it out. Give us feedback. This one does include new features and not just fixes. So we we'll want you to kind of try those out. The new features uh, are, let's see, ah, uh, Metal on Mac, Anim Dynamics, uh, which is what we're showing off today, Skeletal Control for Animation Blueprints, and Particle DOF. So it's actually kind of cool that we're showing it off, and it's what you can actually try out. So next, oh, right, and also on forums, is Stephen Ellis has once again compiled a complete list of all of the new stuff that is in, and also has a list of known issues which you can look at there. So uh, please just let us know. All right. We only have two pieces of news today and the second one is Unreal Engine at VRLA Winter Expo. So we're going to be sending over, it's uh, Ray Davis and uh, Nick Whiting to VRLA and they're going to be doing a couple of talks there but there's also going to be a, a bullet train display kind of set up so you can try bullet train if you haven't yet and it's pretty exciting so I'm gonna have to recommend you do and yeah there we go the actual talks and panels uh, we have interaction and motion controllers with Nick and uh, the active VR enabling first-person shooters and exploration of VR with Ray and so make sure to check those out if you're going they're gonna be really good talks okay community spotlight um, Let's oops, started with the wrong one. My bad. So the first thing first is uh, there's this is actually something you'll notice by the date. It's been around for a while, and I noticed it because someone bumped the thread, and I just hadn't noticed this before. And it's a really great uh, transportation effect in VR. What this does is and, and what it, it's meant to accomplish is it allows you to transport your player without kind of throwing them off from you know, tele just directly teleporting them. And what it does is it kind of draws a line across and, and burns into another view. Um, and, but the thing is, it's completely described, broken down, and everything about how it works is shown. But the author is also asking for people to come help improve stuff. Now, uh, yeah. Um, so if, if you are working on a VR title and you're curious about how should I move my player, check out the experimental stereo camera rig. Um, it's really interesting for that, but uh, it, it definitely, uh, the author admits there are a couple of minor issues with uh, camera work and all that when you're, when you're kind of transitioning from one camera to the other. And, oh my goodness, my computer just started working. <laughs> Didn't say it earlier, but my computer was actually not working. So, very cool. Uh, right. Thank you, uh, Opamp, by the way, for that. Next. C++ camera controlled turrets. This is a new, uh, uh, new tutorial that came onto the wiki, and I just I love seeing a good C++ tutorial with tons of details, nice step-by-step -step instructions, and an explanation of why you're doing the things you're doing, not just follow what I'm saying. So, and and uh, there's a few meshes that are included, so you can get some free meshes off this guy uh, too. So you'll want to see that one if you're and. and the uh, thing that he's showing off is a spaceship. So if you're doing spaceship stuff, this is probably right up your alley. And you're going to want to check that one out. Um, uh, C++ camera controlled turrets. Next. Uh, Procedural trees by Ryan Gads. Now, if you're on Twitter, you probably saw the, the vine that he made of this. But um, And also if you watched the last uh, live stream with uh, Ryan Brooks on it, where he showed off his uh, this this amazing system of foliage for Paragon. This was inspired by that, 
and it's a kind of root system that latches itself around uh, meshes and collision. And um, if you're wanting something like that, he's contemplating either giving it out or putting it on the marketplace. And I, I'd suggest checking that one out and talking to him and seeing if you can get any inspiration from that too. And finally, this one actually came in kind of last minute. Uh, I was I was hanging out on Unreal Slackers, like I do, and uh, you know, Rambo pops in and says, hey, we have this really cool VR experience that we worked on. It's getting featured in some places. Maybe you want to take a look. Um, we have a video. It's called The Caretaker, and it's really inspired by The Shining. It's really cool. I'm going to just let it play itself. So dark, moody, uh, kind of 80s, 70s feel to it with all the, the architecture setup. So uh, if, you're, if you're into Stephen King, that's all for you right there. All right, and that's, uh, that's oh, oh my gosh, I actually almost forgot to do something, and that would have been really bad. Oh, sorry, I have to, can you, can you type uh, in something for me? Can you type in answers on Unreal Engine? I have to go to the answer hub. So, our answer hub winners, and should have done this first, <laughs> apologize for that. Our answer hub contributors uh, are, let's see, uh, T-Tam, Cancel, and uh, Tercio. T-Tam and Cancel, you guys are uh, repeat winners, but Tercio will be receiving a new badge, because I don't think that Tercio's ever won one, so good luck. Uh, good work, not luck. So good work, guys. Alrighty. All right, that's all that we have for the community today. So I want to just uh, hand it over to you and drive and show us what you got here. It's uh, a new Paragon character and all the physics around it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, we're actually, uh, Ben's going to kind of walk through the, oh. the basics of, of what we're doing, and then uh, um, I'll talk about some of the content and how we created it. Cool. Yeah, so we have, um, we started looking at characters for Paragon. If you've watched the uh, the previous videos about rendering animation, you know we're going for a for a high end look. Um, we need to try and define what's what's next gen for our characters. I, um, and of course, dynamics on characters, things that flap around, flappy bits, hair, I, um, packs, wires, plates, bracelets, jewelry, those kind of things. They can add a nice a nice little touch if they start moving around and they react to the character. Um, so we try to. Uh, our normal physics solution, which is uh, the PhysX engine, um, which could perform everything that we needed to do, uh, but we found that it wasn't quite, it was, it was overkill for the things we wanted to do. There was a lot of overhead for scene setup, for broad phase, narrow phase, um, collisions, persistent contacts, all the stuff that we didn't really need, but we were spending time on. So we came to the idea of writing our own small, simple solver that allowed us to put lots of procedural stuff on all of our characters without taking an awful lot of animation time um, or taking a huge amount of our runtime, so it was quite performant. Um, as mentioned, it can be used for loads of different things. Um, it's a very general solution for anything that has to, to move around or flap as a character moves around. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, that's the, the basics of it. So uh, I think Charles is going to show you in action. Yeah, so uh, so we're gonna show you a little bit on on Feng Mao, one of our new characters here. Mm -hmm. um, I think they just started showing off those uh, videos of Feng Mao and Gadget in the yes, middle lane. Yeah, they just released a new gameplay video. Very cool. Um, and uh, so anyway, he uh, uh, when we saw this character, we, we he was a very big inspiration for doing this tool because there's a lot of different things that are moving on him, a lot of uh, 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 unique type of stuff that. Uh, we could do with with uh, the physics asset and editor and and stuff, but it just wasn't quite um, going to be cheap enough or um, efficient enough. So uh, if you, if you look, take a look at this guy, you'll notice you know he's got this chain out here that's on the end of a big weapon that has to swing and uh, uh, move. He's got a ponytail um, getting close to his head here. He's also got these two ponytails on his ears. I guess they're not ponytails, but 
like oh, earrings with dangly right. bits on them. I, I assume um, those were his sideburns, actually. Yeah, and then uh, he's got these bracelets that we wanted to have a little movement. Um, and then down here on his legs, you can see he's got a large uh, swatch of cloth in the front and another one in the back. But the, it gets more complicated on the back and sides here because this this piece of cloth down here is attached to a large armor plate that's got to be hinged somewhere up in this area. And on the sides, you've got, uh, again, you've got these shield pads here, this large one here and a large one here um, that are um, connected to each other. And then these two straps that go over top of that that need to also move independently from up here. So it starts to get very complicated very quick. And uh, um, we wanted to make sure that we could handle all that. So uh, the, the, the anim dynamics allowed us to get there. Um, and I'll show you a few examples of, of some of the different areas, but first I'll I'll load this guy up and run it so you can kind of see him moving, kind of see what the end result's going to be. So, um, <clears throat> so this is him just standing in his idle. Um, you can see that everything's got a little bit of movement to it, but uh, it's pretty pretty basic right now. So if we start him off running, you can see he starts to, to get some of these parts moving, and, and you can start to see where we're getting um, this overlapping animation and movement, uh, specifically with these these uh, uh, little straps, these red straps that hang off of the, the, the shoulder, the, uh, sorry, the, the, the shield pads on the hips. Um, the cloth up here is actually being done, this cloth on his back is actually being done with uh, apex cloth. Um, everything else is um, uh, uh, anim dynamics, so this is 100% anim dynamics minus that piece of cloth. The chain, um, so we have two different types of anim dynamics. Uh, uh, we have the, the the straight regular single bone anim dynamics, and then we have a chain anim dynamics. The single bone, um, Ben will talk about this a little bit more after I'm done showing some of the content. But uh, the the single bone is much more optimized, cheaper. It doesn't have quite as complicated of a calculation on, it, and the iteration on it is is quite a bit lower. And then the chain ones, uh, because it has to communicate up and down the chain, it becomes a little bit more expensive. So you end up with with uh, more expensive, but you can get a better look overall. So the, the chain on his weapon there is using a chain, everything else is using single bone. Then uh, we can do some, uh, we've got some other animations here. We can play a quick melee so you can see how well it, it holds up during a melee. Oh, wow. Yeah, it works, it's working out pretty good. We're pretty happy with the results. Mm -hmm. So. Now let's go uh, go into the editor here and, and, and look at it a little bit. So, um, so this is his anim blueprint, where we have quite a bit of, this is all anim dynamics, so everything here is, is all anim dynamics. So you can see this guy right here is the chain, everything else is a single bone. Um, so I'll just walk through a couple of them and talk about uh, some of the different processes I did and, and, and tricks that I pulled to, to get some of the, the effects you're seeing in there. So the first one uh, we'll talk about just quickly these shot these uh, shield pads. Pull the light around here so you can see it better. So these shield pads right here, you can see on the skeleton his thigh bone is here, and um, just at first glance, hooking up these these um, shield pads and getting them to move. Uh, I could get them to swing, but they weren't really taking movement from the leg because uh, the, we didn't want to make the animators have to go in hand key all of that and, and have them all moving out because we wanted the simulation to just kind of do it for us. So um, the first uh, trick we went with on that was uh, using a driven bone, which is another uh, skull controller. So we got this driven bone here. Um, and what the driven bone's doing is it's just taking the uh, rotate Y of the thigh and retranslating or uh, retargeting that over onto the uh, rotate Y of the shield pad. So I made sure that the bones were aligned so that they had the same directional movement so that when this moved out on the Y, the shield pad moves out on the Y. And I just did a simple uh, driven bone to drive one to one um, based off of its their own individual local pivots. Um, then the shield pad, here is a anodynamics node so you can get a look at it. Um, it's got some Preview settings up here and the initial setup, uh, the constraint setup, um, we can apply wind to it, which is really cool. Um, that's a great feature for if you want uh, uh, anim dynamics on something, but you want it to have a little extra movement. Um, <coughs> and then there's some planar limits and some other settings. So uh, this guy here, uh, 
on the y, I don't want him to rotate at all on the positive, so I've just got him going at about negative 20 on the, on the y. Um, and then I made sure that that is after the bone driven, the driven bone no node in the tree. Um, and what that allows it is means that this is going to drive it on the y, and that's going to give it some movement. And then this is going to allow it to simulate on top of that. So when the leg goes out, the pad's going to go out. But when the pad hits its, when the leg comes back in, the pad's going to have a little momentum. So it's going to kind of keep moving and it's going to flop. It's going to make, give it a look like it's actually moving and being pushed by the leg. So that's one trick we, we uh, did. Um, uh, uh, really quick before I, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm on the right one. I don't think that's the left. This is the right one. So, yeah, so this is the, the right side bone here, and this is the right shield pad. So these are the top and bottom shield pads. So you'll notice, uh, I'll just kind of do a little quick overview of the actual, um, how this, the anodynamics work um, before I go any further on some of the techniques. So um, first off, uh, the first thing you're going to set in here, um, it's got some preview. You want to turn on preview live. That's going to give it allow you to actually see what's going on in here. Um, it's got some uh, check boxes for you to turn on linear limits, angular limits, and the planar limits, um, and collision spheres. So that's just display stuff up there. Uh, the real meat of it is right here in this area and this area down here. So um, just in the most basic sense, um, you're going to set a box extent. What the box extent is going to do is it's going to create a volume shape for the box. Now this isn't actually something you want. Uh, it's kind of different from physics where in, in, in fat, you would go in and you would create that box to be the shape of your object because it's going to use collision. Well, this isn't using collision. So what this is doing is this is actually creating a shape to move um, and use inertia the way you would want it to. So, for example, if you want something that's going to have a very kind of a, a slow lumbering back and forth swing, um, you might want to create it very tall and kind of fat, whereas something that you want to have a little bit more back and forth movement, you might want to um, create more like this. So it's, 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 it's going to kind of settle down and hang like that, but it's not going to, um, it's not going to just flop around a lot, but it's also, you know, going to kind of stabilize itself. So a, a big flat box like this usually works for most things. I've found a few cases where I've made a long skinny box. Um, it kind of all depends on what you want. Then the, the joint local joint offset, what that's going to do is that's going to offset it from its center pivot. So if you, if you put the pivot in the center of the thing um, and you just zero this out and you play it, it's not going to do anything because there's no offset. It doesn't know where to pivot from. So giving this a value of 10 and then giving it a negative 10 means that it's going to basically put the top of the box right at the top of the joint, um, which means now it's going to pivot from from uh, uh, that location at the top of the box. So now it's going to swing based off that. If I were to give this a much higher limit, it would move the box down. The box would be down here, and the pivot would be up here, so it would have a much bigger, broader swing. It would swing a lot easier. So you can kind of balance these settings here to get the movement you want. Um, we can maybe show that in a second here. Um, and you've got springs. You've got um, uh, spring values. You can affect the gravity. Uh, Again, like I said, you can put wind on it. Um, the wind is going to uh, uh, push it based off of uh, uh, wind nodes in the scene. So if you create a, a, a directional wind generator and place it in your scene, it'll affect it the same way it would affect cloth or anything else. Um, down here in the constraint, um, the, the linear types and the angular constraint type, uh, uh, we, there's a couple different settings here. I, I pretty much only use limited and angular. There, I haven't found any need for any of the other settings. Um, I can let uh, Ben can explain that if he gets into more detail um, on, on what exactly they do. And then the the angular axis or the sorry the linear axes and the angular axes here, um, the limits. Those are basically actually allowing you to control the movement back and forth. So. This, uh, if you set the values to zero, that's just off. That means it's not going to do anything. As soon as you give it a value, it automatically starts moving. So there's no extra checkbox or anything there. Um, same with the rotation. So on something like this, you know, we give it a negative 20, give it a little bit of movement on some of the other axes so it isn't completely static, um, and zero on this here. And now it's, it's going to be um, <clears throat> locked into place and, and, and for the most part only moving on this axis back and forth and it's going to stop when it hits that so that, that way it doesn't swing into the leg. Um, 
And then the planar limits uh, uh, we can get into a little bit later. So that's pretty much the settings on the node. So um, you can see this guy here. Let's actually uh, um, go in here. Just drop a, a jog fold animation in here so we can see, see a little bit of movement on it. So that gives us a little bit of movement in here we can play with. So now um, you'll see you know, it's how it's swinging back and forth. It's getting the majority of its movement from the leg, but it gets a little bit of extra bounce from the leg when it comes up top, um, especially on these highlights. You really see it. So they they are a child of um, of that. Um, shield pad that's moving back and forth so they get that movement initially and then again I did the same thing here where I I set their um, <clears throat> limits to be 0 and negative 20 on that axis so that they can't go into the, the pad um, and uh, that gives them a, a pretty decent amount of movement and makes it look pretty good. Now another one of the tricks we pulled um, this guy here, we actually did go in um, because it made more sense for this one to hand animate it. This one here was looking pretty static. It wasn't getting much movement because all of the movements on this are local. Um, they are not, they don't take world space movements. Um, that's an optimization to help make it cheaper. So if there's no movement in the animation, there's not going to be movement in, in the skull control. So for this one, we went in and I took, actually took the bone that, I, that is being simulated and added a little bit of hand key animation to its it's a, a run so that it could get a little bit of bounce on it and that kind of drives it when it hits the, the bottom here it kind of pushes it up um, and let's see the chain the last one we'll talk about here is the chain that this one so that's a, that one was a, a, an interesting issue so this one um, chains because like we talked about earlier um, they are um, they are uh, a little more expensive because they're actually you check this checkbox right here it makes it a chain um, they're actually uh, uh, you know calculating up and down the, the hierarchy to, to give you a better result but as a result they are more expensive so um, we didn't want to do too many bones in it so I have three was a good number so this is even though it's got nine links in the chain we actually went in and I, I rigged this to have only three bones and then we're smooth skinning it between so that it um, kind of gives it a little bit of flex to it but um, uh, then what we're doing is, is you know, setting up just a straight chain. And, and again, it's the same type of thing. Um, you can give it different looks and different effects by changing the size of these things. For example, um, you know, on this, if you take these and set it to uh, like it'll double everything, 100, and 60, and 100. Pile that. You can see that they're much oh. bigger, but now they're they're really big, so they don't really give much movement. They pretty much stabilize out and they they hold themselves steady. Yeah. So it becomes looser as it becomes. Smaller, yeah, the smaller the smaller they get, it's it's like anything, you know. In reality, if you take a large object, it's not going to swing as much because mm -hmm. it's you know it's it's its size and and mass is holding it down. Um, so you want to make it go everywhere. So yeah, if you make it go everywhere, you can go like uh, ten, five, ten. Let's set this to. Five or fifty. It's fifty. Five. Put that to five so that we're not too crazy. Compile that. Now it's going to be much more floppy than before. Oh wow! So it's going to. I see what you call it the around. floppy bits. No. Yeah. Um. So that's kind of how the chain works. Let's get it back to where it was. Let's see. We have like fifty-eight. So anyway, it's kind of a balancing act to figure out where you want those settings to be, and you can you know, make it look pretty good. Is it is it three collisions? Uh, it's so it's three it's boxes. three boxes, yeah, three three different links in the chain. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you could add more joints. Um, it just gets more expensive. It's, it's a matter of uh, it's a balancing act for performance at that point. Mm -hmm. So cool. Um, one more that I did here is to give you some e examples of a couple different types of movements. You can see 
the bracelets here kind of bouncing around and jingling around. There's three individual bracelets there. So um, to do those, they're a very similar thing. There's really not a lot different to them except if I can find them right here. So the big difference with these is on these you can see, let's see if I have it pointing up linear. So they have a, a linear motion to them. So on them, um, I've given them a very small amount of movement on the uh, joint offset here so that they're not going to rotate as much. They're only going to move mostly. Um, and then down here, I give them a, a, a small range of movement um, and a, a, a small range of rotational movement, or a large range of rotational movement, actually, but because they're, they're limited here, they're not going to swing that much within that before the, something pushes them around. Um, <clears throat> and then... Um, Basically, it's just using translation instead of rotation. There's not a whole lot simpler, but I'm using the springs here specifically on this one. Um, a, a, kind of a weak translational spring so that they have a lot of translation movement and then a very strong um, angular spring to keep them from rotating too much. But uh, that's just a, nothing special about the node other than it's just a, a few different settings to get a completely different look. And you I think you did the same on um, on the shoulder as well, didn't you, with yes, the cloth? Yes, exactly. This, um, this bouncing shoulder here is a similar type of thing. That's another piece, which this is what you can use here. Um, what I did here, we've actually used on several characters now. Um, it's, it's, I'm using it to simulate cloth um, in areas like this or also muscles. Um, you can use it to get a muscle look. And to do something like that, I'm kind of making just a really large box, uh, depending on the movement I want. Sometimes I make it narrow, sometimes I make it um, an actual box instead of more rectangular like this one is. Um, but there are just a couple different of those, and uh, the, the real trick to using these is give the dynamic a lot of movement. Let it move, let it bounce around like crazy, and then you go in and on the, uh, in Maya or Max or wherever you're, you're painting your skin weights, go in and skin it really weak. Just give it a, this is like maybe, I think probably the highest influence that this has on anything is like maybe 0.25 to 0.3. So it's a very weak amount of movement so that um, even though you're getting a ton of movement in this, it, the, the, the movement that you get from the, the actual uh, simulation, or from, sorry, from the, uh, the joint is minimalized so that it, it feels like an actual bouncing around piece of cloth and it doesn't like tear it all around and make it make it crazy it makes it a lot easier to to balance the dynamics using something like that so um that's probably covers most of them um as far as anodynamics go i think that's most of the uh the different types that we used on this card yeah 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 hmm. so i can um i can run over some more of the the technical details about this um so as you can see from it, it's a it's a rigid body simulation. We use these um, these boxes to get the uh, the the inertia for the object, and then um, and move it around. We don't handle any um, complicated collision again. For as I was saying before, from the general solutions, that was a an, uh, an expensive process um, that we really didn't need for for this kind of um, this kind of motion. Um, each of the bodies has a an forward order integration for its movement and an RK approximation for orientation, um, just standard um, rigid body movement. Um, the boxes are the only shape that we allow, and the reason that we have boxes is, um, as Charles has been showing off, you can approximate a large inertia quite easily with the box. It's maybe not the most intuitive to, um, to set up when you see this huge box that's affecting a tiny bit of um, cloth on a character's shoulder. Um, but it does help to explain the characteristics of how, how an object moves. Um, and all the inertia comes off, uh, off of the box. In the future, we may be able to look at, at different objects for inertia, but boxes have kind of solved all the problems that we've, that we've had so far. The, um, the actual constraints that we use, so for, for linear constraints, you can either lock them or allow them to move. So you can have a prismatic or a locked constraint. Um, there pretty straightforward. For, for Angular, we have a couple of different types. We can have a full free cone joint. Um, we haven't found a, a huge amount of uses for those. They allow the cone to rotate along all three uh, principal axes and twist. Um, the, 
the version that we use most of the time, I think in fact all of the time, is the angular version, which allows the rotation on two principal axes um, and locks the, the twist movement. So you can get more things like hinges and ball and socket joints. Um, the good thing about those as well is you can give different different amounts of rotation per axis, which with the cone, you give a single angle and it will move in a cone of that angle. What else do we have with these? We have planar constraints. Planar constraints allow us to to stop a, an object from violating a planar relationship. So if you have a something like a um, a piece of uh, metal or uh, an object that can't pass to another, and the other object's fairly flat, you can define a plane and just say, okay, don't cross this plane, and uh, it won't it won't move through that at all. Do we have any of those on uh, on this character, Charles? Yeah. Um, Is that how those red ribbons are working across the middle there? No, I do not. This character actually doesn't have any planar constraints set up mm -hmm. on him. I could turn it on quick and kind of show you just how they work, but sure. um, getting it lined up and everything would be. The visualization is probably enough just so we can see what it looks like. Yeah, so I'll just grab uh, one of these shoulders and turn it on. So let's turn on show planar constraints and show collisions. And then down here, if we add a constraint, um, we don't really have to get the bone. Let's use his pelvis. We'll just leave all the values at the defaults. So we compile that. Now we've got a planar constraint right there that'll block its movement. Yeah, so you see the um, the looks a little bit strange, but that plane is it's a small part of an infinite plane. Um, and at the moment, the way that that's set up, it's set up to um, make sure that the the center of mass of that body does not cross that plane. It will always stay on the side that that blue arrow point points to, which is handy in this case, the way that it's set up now. Uh, if you had something that was dangling near to a character's feet and they were always on a, uh, a relatively flat surface, you could say, okay, don't go past this area, and then you've got a really cheap ground plane set up. Um, you can do some pretty cool stuff with it. Uh, but that's that's the, the limit of the collision style things that we have. Um, Again, just just to, to make sure this is a super simple thing. We don't want, if we want really complicated physics, we have the physics assets. Um, this is uh, sort of uh, as far as we'd like to go with this, just to make sure that we don't get too many really horrendous intersections. I mean, you can see there that the way that that's set up now, that box has been pulled way above where it should be. Yep. So you can see there's a little bit of a deformation in the mesh. Yeah. And the, the this blue arrow here is showing you the direction that the plane collides with. So. If I were to flip it, rotate it 180 degrees, it would not be pushing it anymore because the collision is that direction and the object is starting below it, so it wouldn't actually um, be affecting it in that way. Yeah, I mean, you can do some some really cool things with it. Mainly it's a uh, ground plane, so intersection tests, but um, I'm sure there's many things that we haven't used them for that they can be used for. Um, these, these can obviously be driven from bones, so yeah, if you have um, a moving bone you want to, to, to define that plane, that can be done as well. Yeah. Um, and as Charles was mentioning before about the chains being more expensive, the way that we actually resolve these forces, the bodies only propagate their force in one direction. Um, with a, an iterative system, when you have things that are connected, forces are supposed to go backwards and forwards, and you have to kind of keep, keep processing that data again and again and again, as many times as you can afford to make sure that it uh, it gets close, it converges to the solution to that problem. If you want to do it in one direction, you make sure that that, uh, that convergence doesn't have to happen. You can go straight to the right answer. It's not always 100% accurate. It's the long chains, you need this kind of um, this cross talk backwards and forwards between the, the bodies. You need the either force and the inertia to move up and down that chain. Um, so when you turn that on, you have a, a, an option for the amount of iterations you perform on the chain. If you're using a really long chain, 10, 20 things long, maybe it's going to get a little bit crazy. It might stretch, um, it might look fantastic. But um, if you have the, the com computation time to spare, you can switch the iteration counts up and you can solve that, you can solve that chain. So that's why they're more, more expensive. Um, the standard node is... Yeah, Charles has just got them up there. So you've got pre and post iterations. Um, you iterate a little bit before, you remove some error, you iterate a little bit afterwards. Um, usually the, the post update iterations should be around about a quarter of the, the pre update iterations. 
But um, yeah, that allows you to tweak this solver as much as you want. We also have, and uh, this is enabled through uh, through configs, but we can um, set how big the, the tick is for the physics update. You can enable adaptive substepping, which is a cool little feature where it, if you say that your tick has to be X milliseconds and your game tick is actually X milliseconds, it will just do it once. Nothing crazy there. But if your frame starts to take longer, it will start to substep these things and uh, make sure that they stay as stable as long as possible. There are limits to this. And we, we can get into a situation where we spiral and just spend more and more time on physics. Uh, so there is a limit where we stop we, where we stop the substepping, so we don't end up uh, freezing the runtime. Um, yeah, you, yeah, can, you can see these guys. So this one here is the chain. This is a single node that drives that chain. But like these down here, these these uh, red straps on the side, those are actually a chain as well. But in the case of those, we're doing three individual chains. So I wanted to have these in here to show two different ways of doing it. So these are individual three strung together individual nodes um, that are not set up as chains um, and you, you get a very similar result um, so yeah, it's it's longer chains that, that, that suffer from it i think the reason that we've got the the chain set up on that uh, the front chain is uh, as you saw before when we had that melee animation up that thing spins pretty fast so yeah. making sure that we do these iterations up and down the chain just makes that an awful lot more yeah. an awful lot more stable yeah, thing miles weapon swings around pretty crazily when you're playing it and the um, the other thing to note about it is, it is uh, I think Charles touched on it before, it's a component space sort of um, system, so it all works relative to your to your mesh. That allows us to skip having to convert that forwards and backwards between um, world space. Um, so the the way that we do world interaction, you can use wind actors. And uh, recently we've had um, radial wind enabled, and radial wind allows us to do like, explosions. You can it, it, it's it's a wind actor. But you can treat it as an explosion. You can put down a really strong wind actor for about maybe 0.2 seconds in, a, in an area, and you can have everyone's atom dynamics burst open and um, be affected by that uh, by that force. Yeah. Um, I think that's just about all the features of atom dynamics. Um, but yeah, it's great. The other, well, the other good thing is it's, it's, it's out now. In preview three of um, 4.11, it'll be. In, uh, in every release from, from now on. It'd be great to see some people get a hold of this and uh, uh, do things that we haven't tried yet. Wow, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what everyone does with this. And and like I, I and you guys have mentioned this before, this is a, a 4.11 feature. Yeah, so they should have yep. access, to, uh, access to it in the preview and all that. So yeah, the new preview's got it. Um, what's also worth mentioning is, um, uh, Charles has said this back plate on, um, on the armor here is um, the only bit of, the, sorry, not the black plate, the scarf is Apex cloth. So we've been working um, quite closely with, uh, with NVIDIA on, on, on Apex trying to make this as performant as possible. We've been making a lot of changes and 4.11 has a bunch of um, cloth optimizations. So if, if anyone's project are using cloth or you're planning on using cloth or you've had a look at it and found it was too slow, give it another look again because we've, uh, we've really spent uh, spent some time hammering down that uh, that cost. It is. An awful lot faster than it used to be. Oh, that's great! Yeah, I think uh, I think that what we're hearing a lot of about 4.11 is uh, performance enhancements after performance enhancements. So that's really amazing yeah. to hear. Um, as long as we're on uh, the topic of, of uh, uh, Apex and all that, there was a question that had popped up about: uh, Is the back end still physics, or is this a custom solver for? Anime? Yeah. So in this in this case, as you probably guessed from the talk, it's it's a custom solver in the mm -hmm. background. Um, we have a, a, a very simple um, rigid body solver, forward oiler integration for positions, arc approximation for orientation, no collision, but uh, it's, it's, it is simple, but it, it definitely, it's definitely fit for purpose. It does, uh, does a really good job in this situation when we're putting this dynamic stuff on characters. Yeah. Very cool. All right. Um, you guys want to do some Q&A then? Sure. Cool. Sure. Cool. All right. Um, now, this is something from the forums that had come in, and uh, it was uh, sort of a uh, first question in a series of questions. Uh, if yes, then there would be a ton more questions. Um, but do you use ragdolls uh, uh, in Paragon? And the answer is there, there's not ragdolls. No, and, not and, ragdoll. and then there's like 10 other questions about how 
we would do it if we we're doing it, but unfortunately, I can't answer that one. Um, so uh, now, do all the characters have their own skeleton, or do they share uh, uh, do they share the same skeleton? And if not, why not? Uh, <clears throat> currently, all of the characters have their own skeleton. Mm -hmm. um, the reason why is because uh, if you've been watching the trailers up to this point and any of the gameplay trailers and footage, they are all very, very, very unique. Yeah. Um, there's very few characters who are similar enough that they truly could share a skeleton or that there would be any real value in having them share a skeleton. Mm -hmm. um, there's plenty of characters that I guess technically could share, um, but um, the, the, the cost of of sharing them and figuring out how to transfer uh, animation data and, and rigs and everything. Um, it, it was just not worth the time and effort to um, doing it. And um, aesthetically, I mean, none of these characters move the same, even if they shared the same skeleton. So um, it just made sense visually to not do that. All right. That makes sense then. Now, that being said, all of their core structures do have the same naming convention. So, you know, the spine three bone in their chest is the spine three bone on every single character. Okay. Um, you know, they all use the same names for the shoulder bones, the clavicle bones, the core stuff. But then, you know, some characters don't have uh, three neck bones. Some characters have four. Some characters have two. You know, the, mm. it, it, it varies, and, and that's where it starts to get very different. Yeah, we get, like, the giraffe character in there, so 15 neck bones. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that makes sense. We don't have a giraffe character but, uh, <laughs> that I'm aware of yet. <laughs> dang. That was going to be my main. All right. Uh, now, uh, let's see. Uh, could you procedurally animate something uh, with Anim Dynamics? And I think that, that you have to kind of preset that up, don't you? You couldn't. Yeah, there, was, there was something I meant to mention this actually um, when we were looking at the graph before. Um, there's a lot of green lines in there that I'd set up earlier when I was testing something. And yeah, you can, you can have, you can like put keyed animation in there and you can apply a little bit of dynamics or um, you can do this dynamically so at certain times you can completely turn the dynamics off and um, the animators can control the bones. Um, I don't think um, we do it with this uh, character. Have you used that at all, Charles? No. Um, well, I think uh, they are doing it in some of his moves. Um, some of his moves that where he gets a little crazy, they're, they're using... Um, we can switch back to the blueprint here for a second. Um, You'll see in here that um, every every node, every anim dynamic node has an alpha. Um, the alpha is driven by a dynamics alpha, so the animators can then tap into that um, during an animation. They can blend it off. It plays the animation. They hand key whatever they want on it. They can blend it back on, and you can make one of these for each individual node, or you can make one like in this case that drives almost all the nodes. Um, so the animators would have control over that too. To control that so that they have the the ability to hand key whatever they want and not be blocked by the animal dynamics um i don't know if that answer is a procedural question but that's yeah, I mean, you, you can you can, it's you can a do technique. procedural stuff as yeah, yeah. yeah you can do procedural stuff as well in the sense that you can affect these bones whenever you want if you write your own nodes your own nodes that want to move the bones around to your own uh, your own specifications you can do that and you can apply animal dynamics before that or after that because it's in the graph and you have the nodes uh, you're in control of this chain, the chain of command here. You can tell each bone what what contribution it takes from all the different things. Like here, we have bone drive controllers that push the, the pad up, and then we apply the physics afterwards. So yeah, the physics just doing, so. yeah, the physics just sees that oh, this is this is moved in space, so we'll do some physics on that. Um, yeah, you can uh, you can you can drive it by animation. You can use the alpha. You can write your own nodes that move bones. It's uh, it's quite powerful. Um, let's see, and uh, so I guess this one's more on the technical side. Uh, uh, is uh, Anim Dynamics uh, expensive performance-wise? And I guess uh, how do you kind of demonstrate performance in that? Then you want to take that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's um, it's pretty good performance-wise. Um, the I'm trying to remember the factor that we we, we got from from using the, the traditional physics assets. Um, it's much more expensive, but it solves a much larger problem. Um, so our smaller solution is definitely, out uh, of the two choices, if you're trying to do something um, small, flapping around in a character, use Anim Dynamics, because it's definitely going to be faster than using um, using something in a physics asset. Um, but if you were going to try and use um, 
you something that you need to get absolute collision on, uh, or you need um, a big com complicated ragdoll. And the physics assets are probably the right solution there. Um, but yeah, it is definitely um, much, much faster. Hmm. All right. Um, let's see. I'm sorry, I'm still going. Just making sure that I uh, got a good question. And there's still questions popping in. All right. Um, so they're all rigid bodies with individual bones. Does that mean the clipping can still occur, or is it handled by collision? And I feel like if you give something enough force, you can always clip it through something else. Yeah, there's. I mean, there's still there's still definitely the possibility of clipping. You know, it, really that that question comes down to how you set it up. Um, you know, in the case of something like this, you know, you'll notice that when he's running here, the leg clips through a little bit. But when you're playing the game back here. You know, and the character's running around and you're in the middle of the game, but you never notice that. So things like that, you know, it, it, it all comes down to how detailed you want to get. I mean, I could probably go in here and um, modify this bone-driven node or add another one to it or go in and hand key the movement so that there's absolutely no clipping. And I, I, I know it could easily get rid of all of that type of thing, but it comes down to a matter of, you know, how much time and resources you want to spend on something like that. So that, that comes down to purely up to you as the user, you know, how you want to do it. So you can definitely avoid clipping. You can definitely um, prevent it for the most part. It's just a question of time. All right. Hmm. Uh, now, this one might not actually be in the dynamics uh, on there. Just, I'm sure if that's just basic physics simulation. Um, so yeah, we can answer that. Um, okay, uh, the, the question is, uh, if you apply simulations to, e.g. head tentacles, do you also animate them, or do you do 50% anim, 50% sim, or are the simulated bones locked in animations? So, um, <clears throat> the way it works is the anim dynamics are calculated in the anim blueprint um, after everything that comes before them in the path. Mm -hmm. So if you... You know, if you in for the, in this case here, you can see I put a jog animation in here. The jog animation has animation on all the bones that are simulated, but the simulation um, is set to the alpha value here uh, for. I guess you want to show me the value, but well, the the, the dynamics alpha value is set to one, so the alpha is going to be one, which means this dynamic is going to be 100% on. Now, the way it's going to calculate it is. Uh, whenever the tree is evaluating, the graph is evaluating the the uh, um, joint's location, it looks at the animation. It uses the animation's position as a starting point, and then it allows it to move based off of the um, settings that you've put like in here, like the angular limits, based off of that position. So um, if the position is at, you know, 45 degrees out, then... Um, and you've given it a, 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 the ability to rotate 45 degrees on positive and negative, it's going to be able to move 45 there and to 45 there. So it's going to, you know, it's going to move up to there and up to there. But if the animation then moves the joint down to here, it's 45 degree rotation limit is from there to there now. Right? So it, it's, not, it's not like just from its starting point or from its ending point. It's purely based off of the rotation of that. So that's why I was it saying kind of early... You can, the way I, I, I kind of nudged this area here is I, I, I hand animated it to give it a little bounce to push it to give it a little movement. So I've just got it kind of going up and down like that in the animation. And when it pushes it up like that, when it falls down, instead of it just kind of falling and hanging, it this kind of pushes it and it just kind of keeps bouncing it up and down and up and down like that. And this, um, when we get the, the position through from the animation, if you've got it on a, a 1.0 alpha, the, the, the physics can do whatever it likes. Um, so yeah, if you accidentally put your character's uh, arm on a free Z limit linear, it will just fall infinitely. Um, but yeah, if you then allow some of your custom animation in there, if you give it like 0.5 alpha and give half your animation, you're still getting some of that data through. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And that that also plays to using other nodes like uh, the bone driven node. Um, you can also use, you know, like a look at node or even a single bone node. Um, there's a whole bunch of different types of scale controls that you can use to drive it. And all of those, if they're before the anodynamic for that specific bone, they will also affect it and they will determine its start position for the anodynamics 
and everything the animal dynamics will then pick up from there so that, that that's how you kind of string multiple things together to get a certain effect or a certain look you're going for mm -hmm. all right uh okay this would be a pretty fast how many uh how many anim dynamics nodes are in this particular character i guess i could uh, zoom out for a second give him an idea all right he has uh, there you go guys take a screenshot and start counting yeah <laughs> So it's quite a few. They're not, not all there. anim dynamics in there. You know, there's like these two here are not anim dynamics and these two aren't anim dynamics, but pretty much everything else, I think that one's not anim dynamics either, but you know, three. So they count them up seven. minus five or something. Yeah, so close to, you know, 25, 30 or so. Oh, wow. That's pretty impressive. And this one's a chain, uh, which is more expensive. So. Speaking of the chain, uh, could you explain the broken chain setup and exactly uh, why you had done that? The What do you mean by broken chain, uh, I wonder? I think earlier you mentioned that there's a chain that's like a series of chains that's been broken up. Oh, as opposed, oh, to, not, as opposed to one doing three one. individuals as opposed to doing a chain. Yeah, what well, um, the exact reasoning? I were curious. The only reason for that was primarily uh, an optimization thing. For these, because I knew that they weren't going to be a very... Um, they weren't going to be a flowing, swinging type of thing. I mean, they spin a little bit, but they only pretty much move on one axis. Mm -hmm. um, the extra expense of having them calculate up and down the chain and having the expense of having a three-bone um, chain is going to be quite a bit more than having three individuals. So it's, it was purely an optimization for performance reasons. Um, you know, I could switch those over and get a similar, if maybe better look by switching it to a, a single node with multiple chains or with a, multiple bones in it as a chain, but um, the, the cost was more than having three individuals, so I just didn't see the reason. And visually, it's just diminishing returns at that point. Yeah, but, yeah. I mean, but the like, behind-the-scenes cost is yeah. way more. If I switched it over right now and showed you the difference, you probably couldn't tell which one was which, honestly. So. Yeah, the, um, the, the, the good thing about it is um, you know, the more you add, the more expensive it gets. But this is a game where one of the motivations is if we use the more expensive solution, we just couldn't do this much. I mean, this guy is a really dynamic character. He's got a load of things going on. Um, and without this solution, we just... You could you couldn't do this much. Um, we just did the, the more the more we optimized it, the more we could do on each character. Um, and yeah, you, you take out the chain on the eyelets, and that brings down the performance of this character, uh, makes them makes them quicker to process. Yep. So, yeah. And honestly, again, like we like uh, Ben was saying earlier, the chains, the 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 chain uh, uh, option is really more for like more than three bones, more than four bones type of thing. If you've got something that absolutely has to be a chain and, and is, you know, seven bones, eight bones, nine bones, setting it up as individuals like this, you're going to start to really notice that it's not a chain hierarchy. It'll, it'll start to look different because the further down it gets in the chain, the, the less it's going to, information it's going to have about what's going on above it and, and, mm -hmm. and vice versa, and you're you just end, not going to get as good of a look. And what, you end, what you end up seeing with a chain uh, that long is... You pass all these forces down, and you have this 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 mass at the bottom that moves, but it doesn't pass its force back up. So you essentially get this this pendulum that goes backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards and never stops moving, um, because the forces only go in one direction. Um, yeah. So so yeah, the, the the chain node is really if you start to notice that happening, that's when you need to use the chain node. Yep. Hmm. All right. All right. That makes. I mean, I guess that makes sense then. Yeah. Um. All right. I think. Uh, We'll do uh, this one last question, and I'll let you guys go, because I know you have a lot of stuff to do. Um, but uh, someone is building off of that last, uh, the other question about uh, if you had kind of a floppy, like, parts of a body kind of coming off uh, of them. Uh, when you're using anim dynamics and it's deforming things, is that actually changing where the mesh is? Like, if I'm doing line traces, is it going to still see the mesh in its original spot, or is it going to... Uh, actually be moving the mesh. Like, that, that all depends on the setup. So what we do oh, is we okay. move the bones inside the skeletal mesh. So if that bone has um, a body in a physics asset, that's going to move with the bone as well. Um, so yeah, it, uh, I don't think we, we don't use it for anything that has, um, that we can then line trace afterwards. But we yeah, have the, the line trace, but the physics bodies are attached to bones and all we're doing is moving those bones around. So yeah, that should work fine. Awesome. All right. Um, yeah, that's a, uh, that'll be the last one for today. Uh, thank you guys so much uh, for all uh, for coming out and, and talking about all this. It's it's very new and, and unique stuff. 
a lot of people seem to be very excited about it, so I'm sure we'll have a lot of people picking up the 4.11 uh, preview to try it out and give us feedback and uh, report bugs, etc. And um, Yeah, try and catch, uh, get some stuff up on the forum so we can see what you guys can do with it. Yeah, I'd be really curious. Yeah, please tell us everything you can. Uh, just go in and try to break it, you know, it really helps us out. Um, and, uh, oh, and uh, since I know a lot of people had come in today wondering about uh, the Game Jam results, that's next week, guys. So next week on Thursday, we'll have uh, Game Jam results, full show reel, and all that stuff happening. So make sure to tune in then, and uh, uh, thank you all for coming out. We'll uh, see you next Tuesday. Thank you.